This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, objectivity is the subject in life, in the cosmos, and in reality. And I have two experts to talk about it. The conversation will begin in a moment. Speaking of objectivity, I have Stephen Gokaraja and Ted Porter. Uh, they are both uh, academics who have written on the subject of objectivity. And I want to give both of them a few minutes to give a little bit of background about themselves biographically, what their interest in the subject of objectivity is, and anything they may have written about it. So let me start with you, Stephen, if you could just give a little bit of background about yourself. Okay, I teach at the University of Sydney. Uh, my interests are pretty directly in history and philosophy of science. And it's these interests in the history and philosophy of science that have stimulated my interest in objectivity. Particularly, uh, I was struck by what I thought was the shift from concern with truth to concerns with objectivity at the time of the scientific revolution. Where there was no, and the issue there was that there was no separate uh, authority any longer uh, for uh, validating claims to truth, so you needed some other way to justify um, theories and the the, uh, the, uh, that, the way that emerged was objectivity. So I started looking much more closely at what objectivity meant and arguing that it was an essentially modern notion. It was not some, I mean, it wasn't just that it wasn't there before, it was that it wasn't needed before it, in the same way. Whereas from the 17th century onwards, uh, some notion, some modern notion of objectivity was needed in to legitimate knowledge claims in a way that it wasn't previously. And uh, Ted Porter, if you could give a little background about yourself and your interest in the subject of objectivity. Okay, well, I'm from a, an academic field uh, uh, close to Stevens. I'm uh, a historian of science, um, and I participate in a field sometimes called science uh, science and technology studies. Again, actually, I'm interested in the, in, in the, um, the relationship between objectivity and, um, and the truth. Objectivity is it's perhaps more about the, the attitude of the, um, of the scientist, or actually not just scientists, uh, and not about the uh, necessarily about claims to match uh, what's really out there in the world, and uh, I um, I will say that my the kinds of things I want to say about this are perhaps not um, they perhaps uh, uh, change a little bit as the threats I feel we face uh, vary. But uh, I took up the topic again as meaning something different from truth, and perhaps associated with well, ideals of standardizing and of making knowledge impersonal. Uh, and uh, that is a thing which is sometimes, uh, you know, for the good and sometimes uh, more questionable. So, uh, but it's very much a moral dimension, and I, I have the feeling that we're both interested in that. Well, I'm uh, associated in the arts, and oftentimes you hear Nostra like uh, art is truth, and I've always said that the difference between uh, truth uh, and reality is that uh, truth is always a comment on reality. If I say that uh, Dan Schneider is interviewing uh, Ted and Stephen about objectivity. Uh, well, that that that's that's the reality. But the comment that by by stating it, that's that's that statement is either true or false. And so there's always a, a there's always something different between truth and the base reality. And I think I think a lot of people sometimes get mixed up about what objectivity is. So I want to just define it because to me, when we talk about something that's objective. It, reminds me of uh, when people thought, talk about a hypothesis or a theory. And when they say a theory, there's a difference between a scientific theory and, you know, when we mean theory, meaning really just sort of a colloquial hypothesis. So uh, how would both of you define uh, what you would consider objectivity? Uh, let me start with you, Stephen. Um, well, if someone makes a claim to know something uh, or to say that it's true, you can you can ask what is it why are you saying it's true what is it that makes it true and the only kind of answer that one can give is you can 
just provide the evidence for what it is that you've said. There's no, you can't kind of point to anything. It's just that they, what, what you're actually asking for is evidence. So in a sense, you can never go beyond the evidence or the justification for the claim that you're making. You can't go directly to the proof. You can only go to justification. So what secures the right kind of justification? Well, it's objectivity. In that sense, I think objectivity is more like an alternative to truth rather than something that captures truth. Um, it, it, it's a way of it, it's a way of securing that the justification that you give for your knowledge claims um, is something that can be accepted by those who are who are making the knowledge claims. How about you, Ted? How would you define objectivity? Well, I'm going to say that. Um, the word has a cluster of meanings, and I'm, I, I'll focus here on uh, the one that I've, or uh, the, the the set that I have written about. But I, um, um, that, you know, one could say quite a lot about this topic. But I like to think of uh, uh, when I think of let's say of objective, I think first of the uh, the kind of counterpart or opposite, which is subjective. So object objective um, is typically used for things which are independent of the particular people uttering them or independent of the interests that they might represent and perhaps even uh, you know as uh, kind of routinized as mechanical as possible so that, that's not the only way that the word is used but there are quite a lot of uses which are very important which um, reflect that we say uh, a test is objective and that usually means that uh, you can score it by a machine so it doesn't depend on the on who the person is and the case of uh, scientific statements, often that standard um, that we apply, you know, often, often, often it, it has to do with what other competent people, supposing that the, the, you know, the, 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 the person speaking is already a competent person, or there other competent people agree with that. So, I mean, I also agree, you don't kind of get at truth directly. You need the, to ask what kinds of evidence you have, and those, that evidence can be um, uh, can be about the you know the, the things you, you can say about what you know about the evidence about the you know the data or the evidence you have. It can be about the relationship to other competent people. And there might be time when we are interested in the thing being objective, where it might not be, that might not even stand for the best kind of knowledge we can have. And I would uh, again instance the objective tests, which might not. Um, might not bring out the, um, the kind of knowledge we most want from students, but uh, do provide a convenient way of assessing, uh, you know, what they know. So, and um, um, and uh, you know, scientists are communities of trust, but they are also are communities that doubt, and they sometimes uh, value, as we do in ordinary life, this other kind of objectivity, which is the one which tries to minimize. Uh, what's personal and subjective. So well, that's, um, yeah. well um, in modern culture, say in the last 30 plus years, certainly objectivity has gotten sort of a, a bum rap, uh, especially in political circles where people will talk about my truth versus the truth. Uh, people from marginalized groups uh, of people will always try to, try to subjectivize things. Uh, but I mean, Ultimately, if I have a dozen apples to sell, you can say I have 17 and Stephen can say I have three apples. But if I, we count them and all three of us count them, we're going to count 12 apples. So I would assume that both of you do believe that there is a fundamental objective reality that we can determine, even if not with our own senses, but that there is a determinable objective reality. Uh, would both of you agree with that? I think it's a bit problematic because one of the sources of relativism, a mistaken source of relativism, I think one of the sources of relativism is that in the course, particularly in the course of the 20th century, a lot of claims that were taken to be um, objective and um, not and incorrigible, really not open to correction, turned out to be wrong. They just turned out to be traditional claims. And so questions started to be asked about what was objective and what wasn't. 
Now, one way you could go is to say, well, nothing's objective. Something's true if it's true for me, if it's true for you, fair enough. That's obviously not a very fruitful path to follow for the kind of reasons that you've just given in the Apple example. But there is a problem. I mean, you can't you can't just say, well, there's objectivity, there's, there's truth, there's a way the world is, and that solves the problems because it doesn't, because there's a host of difficult cases in the middle that one that one has to cope with. And I think those are the kind of cases that Ted and I both have interest in. Um, those cases where objectivity becomes a slightly problematic notion and we have to we have to contextualize it in various ways. Ted. And I'm going to agree with that. There are certain, there are some things which uh, you know, like the number of apples, which probably you know, even even that we might find a basis for challenging it. But probably that's just quibbling and uh, uh, and doesn't amount to much. But um, the interesting things are hard, um, and um, somehow we need to. I mean, let's say um, you know, objectivity as an attitude would stand for perhaps. Uh, conscientious pursuit of what's valid or true um, and uh, a lot of the time when we um, when we well, you know we challenge people and we challenge you know, when we challenge science uh, the, the, certainly much of what science uh, teaches us about the hard issues is not is going to be either is going to prove to be somehow I say prove to be in a future generation uh, people will think somewhat differently about this um, and yet uh, there surely was also some serious basis for what they have been saying, and we need to be able to judge things like that. So, uh, and objectivity might stand for a kind of a kind of attitude and a competence, um, which uh, which we can accept, even though we um, we, we we don't think that uh, that the last word has been said. Well. Uh was when we think of objectivity and the scientific method and uh, things like that meant to prove things objectively, uh, we we usually go back to classical Greece as the the beginning of it. Did other cultures like China or India or some of the other early cultures also have uh, 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 methodologies for trying to get at objectivity, or was this a classical Western idea? Uh, either one. I think it's difficult to describe uh, classical Greece in terms of objectivity. They had certainly had criteria for arguments that you that um, you uh, that you put things in a factual form, you create contradictions, and then you try and show which of the contradictory things is the is the true one, and that you exercise what I think Aristotle calls something like intellectual honesty which is that you kind of aim for the truth. Now, that's something like objectivity, certainly, but it's not, it, it doesn't exactly correspond to the senses of objectivity that we want to capture in, you know, science since the 17th century or in uh, disputes about aesthetic questions or ethical questions or something like that. It's a bit different. But modern objectivity is mixed anyway, I think. The, the, the kind of the way in which you would try and capture objectivity in science is quite different from the way in which you would try and capture objectivity in ethics or in aesthetics. There is perhaps some common core, but it's really very difficult to uncover that core. When? Why is that, Stephen? Because you don't have a uniform notion, because the problems are different. It's not just that the context is different, it's just that what you want, if you like, what you want objectivity for is going to vary if it's an argument over ethics or an argument over science or an argument over ethics, mm -hmm. where lots of people don't see any room for objectivity at all. They just think it's a matter of opinion, whereas when pressed it becomes clear that it's not, that there are sometimes good reasons for preferring one thing to another. So objectivity seems to come in, but it's not like scientific objectivity. You don't do an experiment or something like that. Do you think that people often, because I see this in the arts, that people often uh, take what they like as to be something of quality? Because people will often say, I, I've run into many people, especially young people, who will say, well, uh, all sorts of music are, are good or whatnot, but then they'll they'll turn around five minutes later and say, oh, well, that band or that 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 artist sucks. And, and you, you know that they're basically just saying that, well, they prefer 
this group to that group, this type of music to that type of music. So do you think that people sometimes mix up their own personal likes and dislikes with uh, an objective critical stance of something? Oh, definitely. I think there's, there's, there's all the difference in the world between my preference for vanilla ice cream over chocolate ice cream and my preference, you know, for Schoenberg over Tchaikovsky. It's completely different. In the latter case, I can argue with people about the merits of the music. We can, we can go through stuff, we can kind of talk about it, it relies on a knowledge base and the rest of it. Whereas preferences for ice cream don't. It's just, you know, if you prefer that, fine, I'm not going to have an argument with you about it. This is nothing to argue about. There's no, there's no kind of cognitive issue at all. Whereas in the other case, there is. And that's, that's a very, very difficult. I think aesthetic arguments are difficult, but you're quite right. There are at least two different kinds of things here, and people do confuse them. They think that preference for music is that they assimilate it to preferences for different flavors of ice cream, or whether you prefer, you know, mashed potatoes or chips or something like that. And that and that would probably be. I, I, but one, one second, Ted, and I'll, I'll get to you in a moment. Um, and that would probably be because your taste buds are different than Ted's. Whereas if I ask both of you. Uh, what does Marilyn, you know, what does Marilyn Monroe look like? You could probably both pick up, you know, you could recognize Marilyn Monroe in your minds and and visualize the same, you know, uh, movie star. But but vanilla would taste different, slightly different between you and Ted, perhaps, right? Okay, but we all know. Yeah, Ted. No, I, I would actually defend the uh, the cognitive content even of the ice cream. It's not as if in the end, you know, you, neither with the music nor with the ice cream are, are, are you going to refute me. Let us say, I might like Tchaikovsky. Uh, and, uh, but we can talk, I mean, so we can talk about a lot of things, which you might bring me around to thinking, oh, I just never heard it that way. And I'm sorry, so that, that is also true for the things we eat. And we all, our tastes develop. Uh, we sit around tables and we t talk about the flavors and the thing we're eating. And I might come around and say, yeah, that's, um, I see that now. Um, you know, I, I mean, I certainly learn to like they like the tastes of things from uh, from the discussions I have about them. So, uh, so I think actually everything, all you know, I don't know, almost everything can have a cognitive content. Uh, the music is going to, for for many of this is a rich. We have a richer vocabulary for that, but there are very rich vocabularies for uh, you know for wine certainly. Whether it's all puffery, you might not. And I, I in the end say. Not exactly, but it's but you sometimes aren't sure what you're talking about. Well, so, um, I was you were asked you asked earlier about the about the you know whether the you know Western or whether the, the Greek tradition is the unique source of this, and I would be very reluctant to to say that uh, you know to identify a thing like objectivity with a single culture um, and uh, within yeah. whatever if if the Greek culture is continuous with ours, which at least it is at least. In the sense that, for a long time, uh, you know, the scholars and students have been looking at the, you know, and admiring in the West, have been looking at it and admiring Greek culture. Um, um, still, the word, the objectivity, or whatever these, these, this cluster of words about truth and objectivity has changed its meaning. The word objectivity in the, in the senses that we use it, I think, hardly appears before. I don't know, Kant, or maybe even later than that. <laughs> It's really a hard thing to say. Well, people, when they uh, argue uh, against uh, objectivity, they'll often use the more nebulous things. They'll talk about uh, preferences in art or scientific theories. But certainly, for example, if we go and, and look at something objectively, like a well-made house that stands up against, you know, an earthquake, uh, you know, we you may disagree over whether one architect is it makes better buildings or more aesthetically pleasing buildings, but you can't really argue if one architect's buildings are rickety and another architect's buildings aren't. Uh, if someone scores a goal in soccer, we know that they've scored a goal because they've kicked the ball past the goalie and between, you know, and into the net. Whereas it's much more difficult to say whether Mozart or Beethoven was somehow the greater composer. Uh, so do you think that when people talk or, or state that uh, there is no objective way for to determine a b or c what they're really doing is defining their own limits the the the, the fallacy of self limits then um yeah, but i'm um, so 
know, the, 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 the fallacy of the limits is that uh, um, that I um, I make pronouncements because I don't recognize my limits. Is that well? For example, let's say if uh, you you told me that you could bench press five hundred pounds and I can only bench press two hundred. If I went around saying, "Well, you're clearly a liar because I can only do two hundred and therefore no one else could." I'm imposing my own limitations as a person on the rest of the world in the same way that someone who, who says, well, I can, I can obviously see when someone scores a goal in soccer, but I can't obviously tell the difference between uh, Beethoven and Mozart, who's better. But, but someone sh can, should probably be able to. Presumably the, the greatest classical uh, musical critic could. So you know, faced with the uh, you know the, 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 one of the greatest classical uh, you know critics who uh, would deign to talk to me, I would be uh, I would hope to learn a yeah. good deal more than I you know now. And meanwhile, I listen to music and I try to figure things I try to figure things out. And having been to lots of concerts, I kind of understand you know sometimes what somebody told me ten years ago that I didn't understand. Um, so we are you know we do expect to grow, and I think we can. ask about a, a subject that's come up or a, an issue that's come up in the last uh, 30 or so years that's made it to the pop cultural level and that's the idea of qualia. Uh, this was mostly a, a sort of arcane idea in philosophy but uh, it, pop, pop philosophers have brought this up uh, in the last few decades and that is that you know if we look at the color red uh, we can never be sure that Stevens Ted's or my red is the same red that w that each of the each of us is seeing. Um, what has the issue of qualia brought to arguments about objectivity? Do you have an answer to that? Uh, well, in, in in one sense, nothing, because a lot of the standard issues of objectivity don't turn on that kind of relativity of uh, perception. I mean, if you think you can extend that notion of qualia about whether my red and your red are the same, and there's a pretty straightforward answer to that, I think, which is that if you do the tests and neither of us are colorblind and the rest of it, then for all intents and purposes, they are the same red. Mm. Um, then I don't think that that bears an objectivity. I think it would be crazy to say, well, you don't, that what qualia shows is that my reality and your reality are completely different because qualia doesn't show anything of the kind. So if you try and generalize it, then you'd get into all kinds of silly issues, I think. But then the moral is, well, you can't generalize from that in that way. Ted? Right. Um, you know, I, I would say I, you can imagine conversations in which you finally say, you know, this person is just not experiencing, you know, this whatever in the way that I am. And there are, so actually back to the matter of, of, of foods, there certainly are tastes where we really differ. Some people can detect, you know, the things in melons or so. I have relatives who, my, my relatives either love melons or dislike them. And so it uh, seems to be, I don't know what. I imagine that I might be totally wrong. That uh, you know that the, the, I happen to like them, but uh, you know I have a, perhaps a greater sensitivity without hating it or something. And, uh, um, but um, yeah, these are 
sorts out. It might be, we might we might find in the family that it's good to sort this out, but it doesn't seem as if there are great issues of truth. Yeah, when you were, sensitivity, uh, there, yeah. sensitivity is problematic because it may be sensitivity that stops. It may be higher sensitivity that stops you liking things like young children as their taste buds are very very intense. They like any very limited range of flavors, whereas when their taste buds start dying off and you get older, all of a sudden you like a much broader range because you're insensitive to uh, to the uh, to the full uh, uh, the full uh, flavor. <coughs> um, let me. Well, that's an important subject. I had a great experience with my own. Go ahead. Son who refused it because kids just have all that wouldn't wouldn't eat uh, onion. So one day I make uh, uh, onion spaghetti. You know this thing, which you cook it for a long time, it becomes extremely sweet. We were eating it; he was very happy. I told him, I told him, I told him before. So this is not a very nice thing. Of me. I said, "This is we're having apples on our spaghetti." I said he liked it very much. He's about seven years old, I think. Like many kids, doesn't want onions. I, after after we started eating, I told him that actually they were onions. And to my total amazement, he accepted defeat, and thereafter he ate onions. And when did that ever happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me uh, get back to. Uh what uh, Stephen had said about uh, the color red and de facto, if, you know, the same uh, rods and cones in our eyes are uh, activated, we can virtually 99.99 .99 to infinity assume that uh, all of the reds that we see are the same. Uh, it seems to me that when people talk, and especially philosophers uh, and even some pop gurus, uh, they'll talk about recently that uh, they think the universe is a virtual reality, that we're living in a computer or whatnot. And I've always said, well, even if that's true, which I doubt, but even if that's true, what does it really matter? It, to me, is like the old turtle go thing going down, you know, where, where the earth is on the back of a turtle all the way down to infinity. But at some point, at infinity minus one, there has to be some base reality because the objective re reality that we have to deal with is that there is something rather than nothing, because if there was nothing, there would be nothing. And I think human beings have a hard time with these big abstract concepts. So when you when you deal with these uh, large concepts of, about, you know, uh, it, you know the nature of reality and the universe, uh, does, does some of the philosophical questions about objectivity become sort of, uh, sort of, this, you know, easily disposed of, or are they just sort of picky yoon sometimes? Stephen, if you want to go well, first. Well, there are some questions that don't make philosophical sense, quite rightly, like virtual reality. Is reality just virtual? Well, virtual compared to what? Yeah. There has to be some other, yeah, there has to be some standard of what real reality is if you're going to call something virtual reality. Yeah. So if, as in the film, uh, the name of which I forget, Ma the Matrix? Virtual, that's right, it's all virtual reality, yeah. then yeah, then, as I remember, it was shown the non-virtual reality, which is, you know, the kind of, the kind of dirty, uh, messy, uh, post-war world. Um, so it can't all be virtual, it doesn't, it really doesn't make sense, there's got to be some kind of reality there. But that's not so much with objectivity, that's just to do with the misuse of scepticism and things like that, which I think is is uh, is uh, different. I mean, virtual reality can be objective. I mean, you know, there's all there's all kinds of um, issues about objectivity that you can raise in in a virtual context. Ted, yeah, no, I feel. I mean, I I agree that typically that sort of um, that sort of assertion is hard to. I mean, it can be amusing for a bit, and then where are you going to go with it? Um, and uh, Unless you really have some access to this other thing that lies behind the world we experience all the time, then it's a, it's a it's a nice game for a while to ask about what, what you know, yeah, what's beneath all the turtles or or so. But in the end, if you see the turtles, that's good enough. Do you think that, uh, and just to get political for a moment again, do you think that uh, the objectivism of Ayn Rand uh, and uh, her beliefs, whether you a pro or con regarding them have somehow infected the idea of objectivity, i.e. that a lot of people have some somehow taken the her form of capital O objectivism versus the lowercase objectivism philosophically and mixed the two in, in, in a kind of noxious way. What do you think, say, the impact of Ayn Rand and objectivism 
has had on the study or the ideas of object objectivity in modern parlance. No, I'm going to say it, in, you know, in the world I live in. I mean, that's it, the people I, uh, I am with most of the time and the things I read, you know, I think almost not at all, but I'm mm. um, I certainly had a, I certainly mattered for the politics in the place where I live. Um, I don't see any, I don't, I, I, it's a long, these are long books that I wrote and I mm. haven't read them, but, uh, so maybe 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 that's the that's the reality behind the reality I live with. But it seems as if it's been very damaging and not helpful. Stephen, do you have a comment? Um, Anne Rand's a very American phenomenon. She's hardly known really outside um, outside the um, U.S. But obviously, it's it's an important. It has been was an important. Group. I mean, one thing I'd say about certain kinds of conservative thought which is paranoid conservative thought, is that there's a, there can be a claim to kind of greater objectivity because paranoid people will claim that all these things that other people believe are not real, are, are, not, um, uh, uh, are not justified or legitimate, but that there's, and, and that what paranoia gives you is a much, is a much, uh, is a kind of, refined judgment on what matters and what doesn't and within that they could regard themselves as objective whereas the rest of the world just doesn't know what they're talking about well let me ask Does that make sense? yeah well, let, let me just ask you about some strange beliefs that uh, I mean people have throughout centuries had really bizarre belief systems I mean some people like uh, Richard Dawkins would say that all religion is certainly uh, objectively silly but I mean things about, like seeing ghosts seeing monsters seeing UFOs the Virgin Mary, uh, uh, being visited by spirits, speaking in tongues, uh, all of these kinds of things, near-death experiences, being abducted by aliens, uh, all of these kinds of things, you will get sometimes very convincingly sane people that you could go and you could debunk their 10 pieces of evidence, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and yet they will still stick with it. And certainly you, you guys, I'm sure, know of, of studies of people who uh, a college professor is giving a lecture, someone runs into the room, steals his, his briefcase, runs out, and then out of the 50 students, virtually none of them get the details correct. Everyone has their own version of events. So uh, are, are human beings, do you think, functionally incapable of being objective? I think there are some kinds of things in which human beings engage, like religions, where objectivity is not really the issue in terms of fundamental beliefs. I mean, if someone believes in, you know, the Trinity and the Incarnation and the Virgin Birth, things like that, it seems to me completely inappropriate to kind of say, well, those aren't objective um, beliefs. It's just the wrong kind of discourse. It, it, I mean, it's not. It's not just kind of simple fantasy. It's just a different. It's a different kind of discourse. Now, there are, of course, cases like the disputes over evolutionary theory and things like that, where you could get a conflict between, say, scientific and religious beliefs, and that's different. But left to themselves, it seems to me that um, a lot of religious discourse, particularly on basic dogmas. Um, is not the kind of thing where notions of objectivity are appropriate, and I'm not even I'm not even prepared to say that this is good or bad. It's just it's the you know I call them mythological forms of discourse that do things that science can't do. Good things in some cases that science can't also do bad things, um, where it's just inappropriate to talk about objectivity. So what's the moral of that? Part of that is that when people make claims, it's not always appropriate to think in terms of objectivity. Ted? Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I on the whole agree with Stephen's comment, though. Um, it is also the case that these other kinds of discourses don't, aren't, aren't, aren't kept pure of, or I should say that is say of people. Sometimes we say this is that we're talking really about something else here, and then. At other points, uh, uh, people get in arguments about the relation between these doctrines and scientific claims. So um, it's a tough matter. Um, and um, well, I don't know. We just 
that we just uh, you know, discussed a little bit about what it, what, whether it makes sense to say that you know my experience of red and your experience of red are quite different, and I sometimes think that what I ex you know, expected of a religion that I would say in the end moved me away from religion is not the same thing. In fact, that people who are just as smart as I am and just as you know acute and so on think religion should provide who do continue to practice religion. So, uh, and I actually, I, I believe firmly that I was expecting something, you know, when the people talked about, you know, the, these religions are saturated with the language of truth, but it's a different kind of thing. And, um, and uh, you know, it provides, it provides meaning for people. Um, it is, you know, it probably isn't subjected, uh, is, isn't, uh, amenable to the kind of criticism that we make, but then it spills over and they begin saying that, you know, that it's in the Bible, so whatever, you know, the earth can't move or, um, or you know, uh, or, you know, biological species are fixed or whatever, so we face that, we can't really, we can't clean, you know, we can't keep it a clean divide between religion and, uh, and science either. Can I just get back to quality very briefly yeah, on the reds? I'm, I'm just thinking of that. I think I'd be prepared to take a very hard line on it. Someone who said, well, we see red differently. I'd say, well, you know, here's, here's you're not colorblind. It's a kind of ordinary air medium. Here's a good, strong light. It's not distortionary. Here's a red sample from a color chart. We both see the same thing here. And if they say, oh, well, maybe, you know, I don't see the same thing. I'd say, well, Show me a picture of what you see when you see red, and I will compare it with mine. And if it's different, I'll say yes. But of course, that's not what's on offer. Yeah. There is no picture of what they see when they see red that I can compare with my picture of what I see as seeing red. So in that sense, I'd become what you know philosophers used to call verificationists. <laughs> I'd say this thing is just meaningless because there's no way you can decide this ridiculous difference. Yeah. Well, um, let me get back, though, uh, to something maybe that it, you, it, you can get a bit more of a handle on. Uh, in criticism, for example, whether we're talking social criticism or art criticism or political criticism, there's the idea of intentionality uh, that the purveyor, whether it's the artist or the, the theorist, uh, is, is putting forth something with a clear intent to do something, uh, but to be objective means we have to stand back and not take that into account. Do you think that uh, one of the reasons people have uh, problems with objectivity is that it's very difficult for most people to not have their bring their own intentions when criticizing something that someone else m most likely has their own intentions of, a clash of intentions? Stephen? Well, you can't do without intention. So you can't, there isn't any way you can kind of divest yourself of all of all your intentions. That's not what objectivity is about. Ob objectivity is about coming to proper, justified, legitimate judgments on a basis that other people could agree to if they had the same information. Now, if the intentions kind of stand in the way, and intentions is a broad notion, but intentions stand in the way, then you can... There are presumably ways of going through the intentions and sorting out what's at stake. It's not. It's not just a. It isn't necessarily just a stalemate, but it certainly isn't a question of ridding yourself of assumptions, or judgments, or intentions. Because objectivity is not about being judgment or intention free. It's about having legitimate, justified reasons for the judgments that 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 you make. It's a sophisticated thing. It's not a strict back form of operation. Ted? I mean, I know I agree with that. We, uh, I mean, of course, we aren't always uh, entirely successful at stripping, uh, stripping away these intentions and, uh, and ambitions and, you know, perhaps biases that we bring to the world, but that's what we, that's what we want to try to do to, uh, to, uh, <coughs> To to, uh, to to decide what we think is uh, is, uh, is valid on the basis of the evidence that we have. Well, let me get back to the idea of uh, scientific uh, objectivity, and I've I've often used the analogy that uh, in in my experience, I think that uh, subjectivists, in order to people who claim that we live in a subjective universe, 
subjectivity has to be total. Uh, whereas objectivity, if you have one objective fact in the universe, you can parallax any other thing against that one objective fact. I.e., if let's say we had a big uh, Pacific Ocean's worth of pure H2O water, I could prick my finger and drop one drop of blood in it. Now, it may take 10,000 years for that drop to thin out throughout the whole of that Pacific, but the moment I drop my, my blood drop into that Pacific, it is, it is no longer pure. And I use that, that as an analogy, that the moment you have one objective fact, you live in an objective universe, even if 99 plus percent might be subjective, you still live in an objective universe. Do you think, either of you, that that's a tenable position? Um, well, just quickly, Dan, I really don't like the symmetry of purity. <laughs> I think this is the wrong way to think about objectivity. It's not a way of purifying at all. It's a much pragmatic way, a much more daily mundane type thing of settling um, competing judgments. Would you say I objectivity is more of a verb than a noun then? In your, your it, No. To talk about purity brings it much closer to truth, and I think that's misleading. It's not like truth. It's, it's, it, it's geared differently. I mean, I think really helpful in this respect, and I've learned masses from Ted in, in this way, is his stuff on the origins of objectivity and accounting and practices like that, why it's, why it's brought in, a kind of proper contextualization of the origins of objectivity that, that for me anyway, help this idea of distancing it from some kind of scientific truth and showing what its what its function is. But anyway, that's... Yeah, I would mention in this context actually the reasons why we might not be so happy about objectivity, at least as, as we ordinarily use it, and that is if, uh, if, if, object, if, if the idealization of objectivity means we look for that little nugget of truth which is just totally beyond contest. And it's nice to have truths that are beyond contest, but do we? what do we do with all these other things for which we use words like interpretation, which I think are extremely important, without which we can't live, but they don't They don't achieve the standard of, you know, the uncontestable truth. They don't become, uh, you know, maybe if we only want uncontestable truths, and maybe mostly we have truths that don't, don't, um, don't matter that much for us, and the ones that really matter for us, I mean, they have degrees of objectivity, they aren't totally without, uh, you know, credibility, but, uh, but we need, uh, we need, you know, we deal with many things of the, you know, the most vital importance that are never going to be reduced to incontestable factual claims. Well, Ted, let me ask you, since you've written about uh, uh, numbers and uh, statistics, um, some people would argue that uh, even numbers uh, or uh, statistics, you know, certainly can be manipulated. But, um, uh, and I, I've d actually done some shows where I've talked with people about uh, the idea that could there be, you know, is, is mathematics uh, a fundament of the cosmos or is mathematics simply a language that human beings use to express the cosmos? Would you fall into, I would assume you would fall into the camp that the numbers are a human language, that there could be, if w there were an alien mathematics, for example, they may be able to, to get to objective reality somehow better than we, our human mathematics could be. Or what is your position then, Ted? Um, mathematics is both, I mean, mathematics grew up actually as, first of all, as a practical tool for dealing with questions of number and, uh, and uh, let's say, geometry of space and, you know, surveying and things, and it has... It developed at least a highly abstract form, which some of which doesn't, or um, you know, perhaps we are legitimately surprised when we find a link between a mathematical, some mathematical forms and the world that we experience, you know, with our senses. Um, and um, um, yeah, uh, but uh, you know, some in some alien world, probably their mathematics would have a lot in common with ours, but. Uh, you know, there are subtle things that people, that mathematicians within our world thought about um, and, uh, you know, contested what's a, what's a legitimate mathematics and even the argument, depending on what you think, you know, there were people that certainly, you know, imaginary numbers were contested and even actually negative numbers were contested and there is 
actually, depending on what you think a number should do, it can be a legitimate contest. But imaginary numbers actually, you know, fill, you know, uh, you know, that is they provide something which people could use within the mathematics that didn't yet have them, and it was irresistible to mathematicians. But for me to say so, actually, so if you, uh, if you, uh, if, you know. Uh, you know, you know, as it were, live, but you live, you live your life dealing with this mathematical world. It's very hard to say that there are no imaginary numbers, but I might as well wear it. You know, I look all around my room, I can count my books, and you can count your apples, but I don't have imaginary numbers of anything. So, you know, um, you know, there is a, there is a, you know, a, a, you know, an expectation of mathematics that does make things like that, you know, um, un objective or, you know, or, uh, you know, un unjustifiable. But, you know, there is a, a you know, or, uh, you know, the, the universe has more than three dimensions, even if it only has, even if it has, it were only had three dimensions, because you can, it can be useful to draw graphs with six dimensions and nine dimensions to see the interactions of, uh, you know, of a, of a lot of things at once. Um, but, um, but so, math, I mean, so, you know, mathematics is situated very interestingly between, you know, a, between a uh, attempts to describe the physical and not just the physical world we live in, and attempts to. Uh, you know, to get at this uh, fundamental um, form of knowledge, or whatever this fundamental, this this kind of universe, which is not just our the one we live in, but the special world of mathematics, which is super interesting too. There were debates over the objectivity of math. There have been debates over the objectivity of mathematics, in particularly, particular whether geometrical proofs bring into play purely contingent features about human beings, human ways of thinking, uh, that may be algebraic proofs. So, so the question of mathematician and physicist Lagrange at the end of the 19th, at the end of the eighteenth century starts his great textbook saying there's no geometry in this. It's purely analytical algebra. Why? Because geometry is 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 unnecessary. It's just an added extra. At the beginning of the, at the 20th century, some of the logical positivists thought that you've got to strip mathematics of purely contingent features of human uh, thought, like geometry, and just do it in purely abstract terms. Because if there were little green men on Mars and the rest of it, you had a different mathematics from ours, it may correspond to our algebra, but it wouldn't correspond to our geometry because that's a feature of human beings. Now. That, I think, is a crazy debate, but it's it's a crazy conclusion to the debate, but it, it raises really interesting issues about to what extent mathematical formalism is purely abstract and universal, or whether they could be such a thing, whether, why would you want such a thing, what, what would motivate that call, or whether it's to do with really contingent features of the human mind and the way we see the world. So there are issues even in the history of mathematics that raise questions of objectivity, but they're very different from objectivity, I think, in science and elsewhere. Well, let me ask you, uh, before I end this segment, uh, uh, do both of you, do you think that the striving for objectivity is a good thing? And if mathematics uh, or science or what what discipline do you th think can get us from here to there with the end goal being ob objectivity, if it is a good thing? Uh, Stephen, if you want to go first. Uh, I think it's very dangerous to model uh, uh, issues like objectivity on one discipline over another. I think the issues in science about objectivity in science are very different from the issues about object, or maybe not very different, but they're usually different from the kind of issues that you have in ordinary common discourse. They're different from the kind of issues that arise in ethics. They're different from the kinds of issues that arise in aesthetics. And I think, in, I mean, there was a time, the first half of the 20th century, particularly in someone like Popper, who tried to extrapolate from scientific ethics to the population in general and ended up saying, you know, scientists are the only really honest people in the world because they're the only really objective people, because they're the only ones who try and falsify their, their own theories. Aren't they wonderful? And that that kind of approach is crazy. Ted, and I hope Ted agrees. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is good. I, we're you know we're we're uh, you know histori or historians of science, historians of historical philosophers of science, and um, you know it's hard to make a you know a, a universal claim. Um, 
but that sometimes the again you know objectivity is the word which in fact has many valences valences and some of those i find problematical but at this moment living in this country you know a lot of days before the inauguration of a new president who has made his career you know i'm going to say lying about anything that he isn't totally satisfied with the um, the need for some kind of ways of judging truth and uh, or intentions to find truth seems you know quite pressing to me and you know a few decades ago i was perhaps more impressed by scientists that i thought were over you know overreaching or claiming too much for what they could do so we you know we uh, but uh, at this moment i certainly say we have some kind of some kind of a you know a respect for the ideal of objectivity seems extremely seems of fundamental importance and these uh, absences are painfully you know felt at the, you know now but other times uh, or for other for other purposes i mean in other, in other moments i'm un, I made unhappy by you know as i said for instance wanting wanting something you know the whatever little bits can be absolutely true and we forget for a while all the more important things that we can't handle in that fashion so and we have to we have to deal with those too and somehow you know an ob, ob, objectivity as a spirit of research and an attitude and a, a, you know respect for, for uh, collective inquiry is uh, you know is uh, deeply important and you know for um, uh, for us as thinkers and for us as members of societies which are you know always a little bit fragile and uh, always confront problems that we have to address you know with uh, the, the real facts Okay. Well, well, let's uh, end this segment here in the final segment. I'll give you both a minute or two to wrap up your thoughts, and we'll do that in a moment. Finishing up a conversation on the nature of, of objectivity with Ted Port and Stephen Gokharaja. Um, just want to give you both a minute or two uh, to wrap up your thoughts. I will link to both of your web pages at your universities below this video, so anyone watching this who wants to contact you or find out more information can go there. Uh, Stephen, uh, do you have any uh, final comment on uh, objectivity, its nature, or its import? Um, well, it's really a follow-up to Ted's last comment about the importance of objectivity. My, my qualification is that in, a, in an everyday political context, objectivity is, is, is closely connected with notions like honesty. And in a sense, that's what's missing as much as objectivity in the present political discourse. Whereas in science, honesty is not really the issue. Other things are, issue, uh, are at issue. So ob objectivity is a general desiderata, but it, it, it's, it's subtly changed by the issues that it gets tied up with in different contexts. And I think the context, the, the issues that it gets tied up with in science are different from those that it gets tied up with in ordinary discourse. And that's why we can use science as a model in some respects, but in other respects we can't. Ted, final comment from you? Oh, I mean, I, um, <clears throat> you know, it's very important to see these, uh, you know, the different kinds of uses of terms like this and of um, ideals like this in different contexts. But uh, again, actually, these worlds come together, and it's kind of astonishing to me. I mean, I mean, it shouldn't be astonishing, perhaps, because I've been living in this world for a long time. But given the extraordinary, you know, the wealth and uh, uh, and uh, institutional support that scholars and scientists have, uh, that how I mean, I guess I'm in this in part because I think that the things that we do should matter in the world outside, uh, in the world outside the academy, and uh, it's uh, kind of astonishing and and, uh, and distressing that uh, the things that really matter uh, intellectually, but not only intellectually, they also matter for how we deal with each other and uh, and the environment we live in. That um, that. Um, the understanding through scientists and scholars can be so weak and have so little traction yeah. when dealing with people for whom, at least I think, uh, these questions really matter as, as much as they matter for us. So, so we have the, you know, the objectivity matters in the world uh, too, and the relationship somehow holding together or finding bonds between the 
scientific world and the you know the whatever whatever this other world is the larger society this seems very important for me as well so the standard of objectivity the standards of objectivity then really matter for us well anyone wanting to find out more as i said i will link to both stevens and uh, Ted's uh, university uh, web pages below. They can uh, read some of their books or look up some of their works. Uh, because as I said, uh, we could go on and I could do whole shows about objectivity and ethics and science and mathematics by themselves. This is just sort of a primer. So I want to thank both uh, Ted and Stephen for your time. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Ted.